Hello, and welcome to the Paraveda New Energy Peer Learning Forum. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining, and thank you to our wonderful panelists. Uh, my name is Derek Bowen. I'm a leader in our Houston office. I've been working with traditional energy clients for about 10 years and with our new energy clients for at least the last seven years. <clears throat> so we're going to kick off today. Uh, I wanted to lay some groundwork just for the conversation about kind of what, what we're seeing and what we want to talk about today. So. Uh, there's broad recognition that the energy industry is being disrupted as scientific, political, and social pressures are pushing us toward a low carbon future. Uh, these changes are making the uh, energy value chain more complex, and they're also creating increased customer choice as companies and homes and uh, just people are have more choice and want more say in the way the energy is being generated and visibility into how they're using the energy and all of that. Um, and we've seen through this disruption that uh, traditional energy companies are expanding and, and changing and making entrance into some of these new energy spaces in interesting ways. And also a lot of new energy companies are entering and uh, coming in to fill and disrupt the existing uh, value chain. Um, and we at Parveda, we see that uh, modern digital capabilities are gonna be fundamental for all of those companies as they uh, look to survive and thrive in this new environment. And by modern digital capabilities, we mean things like partner integrations uh, across the value chain uh, or data platforms that help us uh, better make decisions or um, operational systems to help your people be more efficient, effective, and especially uh, enhancing the customer experience through, through all the different digital means that are there. Um, along with this, kind of talking about this disruption that's happening um, you, you've probably all seen something like this with an example of the energy c consumption that's happened over the last while and estimates for how this is going to change in the future. Uh, we at Private find it useful not so much to try to pin down an exact number, but to think about the ranges, the upper and lower bounds of what may happen here. Um, and today we're really focused on that new energy and that green, uh, the green space. So the question is in front of us, there's pretty broad recognition within the industry that new energy is gonna keep growing and that it's gonna be an ever more important part of the mix. <clears throat> and we're at an inflection point right now where either it could continue growing the way it has been for the last decade, or it could really take off and become the dominant means of en energy generation in the market. Um, and one of the key driving factors for, are we gonna you know, be able to grow at the pace that, um, uh, that many people are looking to see is those digital capabilities uh, and how different companies are able to work with each other and react in real time to the market and really scale to meet the demand that is coming with increased electrification. So with that, we're gonna jump into the panelists. We've got Laura from Engie, Thanasis from Caprock and Mark from Sunrun. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, this is a, a great mix of people from across the value chain and from uh, the CNI side, as well as the residential side and established companies and uh, innovators, new entrants. Um, so as we go through, I'm gonna do a quick interview with each panelist and then we'll have time at the end for, for uh, audience questions. So please enter your questions into the Zoom Q&A section um, below. So we'll get started then with Laura. All right. Um, so Laura, Engie's been on a uh, pretty fantastic journey over the last several years, transforming from a commodity energy company into a really full service energy services firm, helping corporations reach their sustainability targets. Uh, can you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about the products and services available under NG North America today? Yeah, you bet. Um, thank you, first and foremost, for having me. I'm really excited to be here today with all of you. Um, I am Laura Bean, Chief Renewables Officer for NG North America, and I joined NG just about a year ago in April of last year, and prior to that, I built my career over a 25-year period at what ended up being Avon Grid Renewables. Um, I started with Pacific Corp back in 1995, which is a regulated utility in the Northwest, and through a series of acquisitions and name changes, the company ultimately ended up being owned by Iberdrola, which is a big Spanish global energy company, and then doing business in the U.S. as a publicly traded entity called Avangrid. 
So through my experience and my career path, um, I really have developed a genuine love for clean energy. And I believe in renewable energy. And I see a path for continuous movement to, toward a low carbon energy future that is reliable and cost effective. And I think all of those pieces are important for that to be a reality for everybody. But this market in the US is really tough, extremely competitive. And it's more and more difficult to find projects that have acceptable returns based on the investment and the risk profile of these assets. So it became clear to me that future leaders in this industry are going to be the companies that do two things. First, they're going to focus on what customers want and what customers need. And second, they're going to have the ability to offer more than just what really has become a largely commoditized product. We need to offer creative, customized solutions that include multiple elements, wind, solar, storage, distributed energy, even energy efficiency. And that's why I chose to come to NG because NG has all of the right pieces and through their transformation that you've mentioned, NG North America really is committed to helping our customers achieve energy reliability, efficiency, and sustainability. So I'll talk just quickly about some of the businesses that NG has and the products and services that they are seeking to offer. So first we have a cities and communities business, and they partner with the public sector to operate and maintain facilities in a cost-effective way while achieving carbon neutral ambitions. So our customers in this division are cities, educational institutions. You've probably seen announcement of the deals that we've done with large universities, airports, ports, government entities, with opportunities to improve costs, reduce energy, increase the use of renewable energy, and ensure energy and utility reliability while improving the well-being of their citizens and their customers. Our commercial and industrials business, they develop energy solutions that create a better environment for their employees and their communities. So whether it's through solar, wind, storage, or a hybrid solution, they combine these renewable energy sources with traditional resource like natural gas, we're our client's trusted partner to help achieve their energy goals in that division. We also have a supply business that has supplied retail electricity to commercial industrial customers since 2002. So we operate in this capacity in 14 different U U.S. markets where our customers can take advantage of a wider range of efficient, cost-effective energy supply options, including now access to wind and solar power. And I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail later. Our properties business helps to design, build, operate, and maintain cleaner and greener buildings. So we have contractors and property owners turn to our multi-trade network to provide optimal solutions to meet their facilities goals for energy reliability, efficiency, and sustainability. And last but not least, um, our renewables business, which now has more than three gigawatts of grid scale wind and solar assets that are online. This is growing to four gigawatts by the end of this year. We have 400 megawatts of distributed generation assets. And these assets are much closer to the customer, often even on a customer's rooftop. And they enable us to offer specialized solution in the community in which a customer is operating. And increasingly, which is so exciting to me, we are offering these distributed solutions in parallel with the grid scale solutions for customers, which I just think is fantastic. And we have more than 100 megawatts of operational storage assets and a pipeline of nearly three or three to four gigawatts of storage projects that we will be working to bring into operation in the coming years. So I hope that helps give a little bit of flavor of you know, who NG is and what we're all about. Yeah, no, that's that's great. Thanks so much. Um, so providing this these comprehensive array of services for customers. You mentioned universities. Uh, I know NG's got a big deal with Ohio State University. Um, it it seems like these would require integrated management systems as well as uh, modern cloud-based data platforms. Um, how are you? What what can you tell us about what you're doing there and how you're deploying those and uh, in that space? So clearly data and systems are a very, very key component of our ability to deliver these very long-term integrated solutions to these customers, uh, such as you mentioned, Ohio State University of Iowa. And so our team has implemented a smart institutions platform, and this is an AI enabled energy optimization tool. And it's multifaceted, but it integrates data from multiple source systems like electric and gas bills, smart meter data, building management systems, chiller and boiler data, occupancy data for Wi-Fi access points. And it brings all this data together, which enables us to develop improved demand response, energy forecasts, chiller and boiler optimization, facility benchmarking, and savings verification for the customer. 
And so the AI algorithm in this tool delivers significant value to us. For example, adaptive forecasting with and peak prediction helps us to reduce demand during critical peak periods. Mm -hmm. And so really in summary, we're really able to utilize AI to drive improved energy optimization for our customers. No, that's really interesting. How does that, you mentioned also the supply business, how does this generation usage forecast both you know, for CNI clients and maybe also for your utility scale, how do, how do you, where do you see that going and or integrating with your supply business in the future? You know, the supply business actually has a tremendous amount of its own data that they're utilizing for their customers and making sure that they are able to service their customers. And those customers, as you know, particularly in the, you know, markets where customers have choice, they're becoming more and more sophisticated. And so they've developed as well their own proprietary tools and portals that allow them to really understand and just really get to know their customers' needs better. Yeah, that's great. Um, what about, um, how about, so with this, um, one of the places with demand response also looking forward to the future is with uh, applying more storage to this. How, how do you see these digital integrations happening as you look to apply storage as well? Yeah, I mean, and again, I feel like every business that we have, data is such a key component of this. One of the pieces of our storage business is a proprietary software tool that is extremely data intensive. And it's all about figuring out and trying to use AI to figure out when the demand peak is going to occur and being able to optimize the utilization of that battery for op, you know, optimal savings for these customers. So that has become a huge area of you know, data focus for the company. We also now have an arm that's looking at really optimizing the batteries in the wholesale markets. And so bringing together this data on the battery optimization, along with the wholesale market data, it's become a very, very powerful tool for our organization to be able to meet the needs of our customers. Um, that's fantastic. Um, you've talked a lot about meeting the needs of the customers. Um, I'm also interested in how you're engaging with other partners or complementary, complementary service providers to deliver for uh, on NG's full vision. You know, partnerships really, it's an important part of NG's business model. I mean, just we all of our renewables assets in North America have equity partners with them. So that's just a key component of how we do business. But also NG's offshore business is an excellent example of the partnership model. I don't know if you've read about Ocean Winds. They just recently last year announced their new name and their new joint venture, but it's a joint venture with EDP Renewables and NG. And it really just allowed you know, two very powerful entities to come together and leverage their combined strength to gain a foothold in what I think is going to be a very rapidly growing market here in the US. Oh, that's great. Um, yeah, no, that's fantastic. And I, I imagine with that, there's the working together, but doing a joint venture like that would require some amount of systems or communications or collaboration uh, between all the groups involved as well, right? Yeah, most definitely. And there's, there's a tremendous amount of touch points, honestly, that we are identifying between NG service lines. And I really think we are just beginning to scratch the surface of what's possible there. And this is, I think the benefit, a lot of the times with these large global corporations, you end up with siloed organizations and there's so much value that is left untapped. And so we're just now, I feel like really starting to get some momentum around some of these synergies, which are extremely valuable. And for, you know, one example is between renewables and supply. And so our retail business is an off taker now to some of our renewable projects and they have access to this capacity and they can offer to their customers a green asset specific project and solution to their commercial customers that are you know, seeking clean energy solutions. We are finding amazing synergies between our storage assets and the supply business, which helps to mitigate risk and market volatility across these two businesses. And before they were looked at completely separately and there's incredible value there. We've also just recently very excitedly did a, responded to an RFP for a green hydrogen project. And that was in combination with our hydrogen business unit that's done in um, Paris and NG Impact, which is another arm of NG. Um, here in the U.S. Um, we've also begun to explore synergies for improved risk management because NG has a global trading arm called Global Energy Management. And again, we're just realizing there's so many opportunities to bring this all together. And every single facet of this relies on data, 
and information so that you really can figure out how to optimize and deliver these customized solutions to meet customers' needs. Great. Uh, thanks, Laura. We're going to move on to Thanasis now. Uh, Thanasis, can you tell us a little, little bit about yourself and what Caprock Renewables has been doing in the marketplace? Sorry, I had my uh, microphone mute. <clears throat> Thank you for including us, uh, Derek. It's a pleasure to be on uh, such a great panel here with Mark and, and Laura. And uh, Caprock is a, a boutique style utility scale renewable um, project developer. We're based in Austin, Texas. We are developing uh, solar and storage assets for large investors. Uh, and uh, we have a team that has been doing this for more than 10 to 15 years. We've done a lot of wind projects in the past, and now we are focusing a lot more on solar. Um, I have been in the uh, solar utility scale industry doing solar projects and storage projects for the last 10 years myself. Before that, I spent a good time with um, in the IT industry, first with uh, Fujitsu Computers, large kind of $100 billion Japanese company in the start of my career, doing M&A work, and then with uh, Dell Computers in a general management capacity running the corporate business. So um, it's been an interesting transition for me uh, to go from IT world to the energy world. I'm very excited to be here. This has a lot of meaning for me on what we do today. And uh, we see a lot of opportunities here. We see that there's um, some transitions happening. Number one, on, on the source of energy that we're all gonna be deploying in the future. It's a huge transition here to wind and and solar and storage and other renewables. And we also see a huge transition on, on, the, on the type of business model that the industry is deploying. We're going from a, what I would call a linear model in the past to a highly decentralized model. And these two put together create a tremendous amount of demands on large players like NG and, and other large utilities and so it would require a tremendous amount of intelligence and new thinking about the infrastructure and a lot of focus and effort on bringing a lot of IT applications in place to cope with all these changes. Great, thanks. So what sort of digital systems are needed specifically related to the grid to, to move us to this more decentralized model? Yeah, um, let me uh, give you for 30 seconds my analogy. When I started in the computer industry and that will unfortunately show my age, we still had deployed uh, mainly mainframes with dumb terminals. That was another, what I would call a linear model because all the processing power was in the center. And then you had these dumb terminals that you had to kind of exchange some data. And then suddenly we went to what we had uh, departmental systems. So you had mini computers that they would do accounting or they would do customer service. And then from there we had PCs and then suddenly we had processing power at the customer level and that then start changing the whole model. And it, it took quite a bit of time to get here, but now we have this amazing infrastructure of cloud and we have virtualized uh, server capabilities in the cloud and we have mobile computers, which are essentially PCs in a, in a mini form. And this has exploded the ability of, you know, and, and the capabilities we gave to consumers and to, and, and to companies, but it also created this massive infrastructure. I see this parallel path today in the energy industry, as I mentioned with not only the change of source of energy, but decentralization. Now we have a lot of solar and great companies like Mark's uh, company at Sunrun, they're doing a fantastic job growing the decentralized resource of solar and storage. And suddenly we give this processing power, in my analogy, to consumers to do a lot of things with it. And now we have, in the analogy of departmental systems, there's a lot of microgrids that are being deployed at the corporate level or at the small uh, municipal level or smaller solar plants that are a community solar plants that give these kind of departmental uh, activities. So this model is developing the same way as it developed. There's a lot of great parallels that we can learn to. And I think there's a lot of need for systems here to, to kind of be able to do that. Um, there's the systems at the utility level where you know the most basic things that a lot of utilities are doing today is having smart metering uh, capability. And so advanced metering infrastructure is key to that. So to be able to understand what's happening at the consumer level, being able to react, being able to uh, provide better control systems. And, and that's just the basics. We then need to have better telecommunications infrastructure within the grid. 
pretty much like we have today, the, the ability to transfer data between uh, different continents is unbelievable today. We need to do that in the grid. The grid, you know, the, the participants of the grid need to be able to understand in real time what's happening with the other generators, with the customers, with microgrids, with decentralized resources. This needs to be at light speed, literally, to be able to respond. And I will bring here uh, the example of last week, we had a tremendous issue with ERCOT where people wanted to get heating systems up and the grid didn't have enough capacity or enough intelligence or enough ability to respond. This new world is going to be very different. We're going through transitions. We need very advanced IT capabilities to understand what's happening at all the different points of the chain so that we can actually respond to. Building that, we'll need to have also the uh, ability to protect ourselves because in a world where you have all these decentralized resources and you have these computer systems trying to understand and control all the resources, you're definitely going to have cybersecurity risks elevated in a tremendous fashion. If you're going to have millions of installations that are, you know, our partners here at Sunrun are doing, uh, you know, how do you know are these points becoming, you know, uh, uh, issues for the, for the grids? You know, can somebody start penetrating the grid through the solar installations? Do we have enough capacity to protect that? So the picture is getting bigger. And I think there's new paradigms in the industry. And I think, uh, you know, the participants in the industry need to think in a bigger way of what are the implications here? And there's a lot of capabilities that are coming up that um, have to be adopted. Another, another example is uh, virtual power plants that are being right. installed as software capability between houses and neighborhoods so they have solar and storage systems and so they can exchange energy and they can provide the storage ability to the utility. This is a new form of collaboration based on smart software. It's a lot of new systems that we need and a lot of new capability in this new world. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting to think about. You said it's a linear model. I think of it similar, similarly as sort of a hub and spoke the way we worked in the past. Exactly. And with, with this new... Um, complex reality we have with all these distributed resources, <laughs> you can't rely on an air gap at the utility level to, to provide your security, right? By, it, by necessity of having those communications back and forth, there's no longer going to be an air gap. Yes, yes. Right, so that's, yeah, that's both sides. The capabilities to, to communicate and react in real time would be essential. I mean, that's needed for a virtual power plant. Um, and then there's all these other infrastructure that's going to need to be updated and maintained um, on the other side as well. That's great. Um, um, thanks for that. So I uh, also was interested in, kind of in your perspective as an innovator, investor, enabler, uh, what you're seeing uh, uh, as the traditional, what opportunities you're seeing or looking for as the traditional energy industry is being disrupted. We, we see obviously multiple opportunities. As I mentioned, there's opportunities here in the changing the source of energy. And so the thing that we're doing right now is we're focused on producing solar, large utility scale solar plants with storage capabilities on it. And so that's one area that we are you know, hugely focused on. And then the next area that we wanna uh, attack as, as a company is invest in, in software systems that enable all that because of my background, my passion for IT and, and renewable energy. We see multiple opportunities here in, in, like I mentioned, the virtual power plant software. I think that's something that has just started. Some great companies, one company in Germany started having uh, strong installations. It's already been acquired by a large oil company. Uh, I think I, I wanna say it's Shell probably, and forgive me if I make a mistake, but there's already been some applications out there. And I think this is a very exciting part because when you start having millions and millions of solar installations out and storage, then these systems uh, will actually naturally evolve. And it's a great benefit to the, to the consumer. Uh, you need a highly efficient transactive environment to be able to sell energy to each other mm -hmm. on a peer-to-peer -peer basis. You need to have the ability to allow all these systems to support each other. So if, for example, if we had 10 or 15 million solar installations, even at a residential level in Texas last week, we may have not had that crisis. And, but we would need the ability, my neighbor was saying to me, you know, can I, I need some energy from you. Can I buy some from your solar panels? I don't have the capability today. So there's a lot of capabilities there. The other area that is very exciting for us is uh, storage software. It's a new area where, you know, there's EMS systems with tremendous capabilities. 
and those will be deployed at multiple levels on the grid, at the generation level, at the transmission level, for attacking congestion in a very smart way. And congestion is one of these things that with a lot of storage, we can actually avoid a lot of the congestion. Congestion is the death of the renewables and a lot of the energy generation. And I believe that with smart storage placed in, in, in strategic locations and transmission systems, we will actually be able to mitigate a lot of that congestion and also at the residential level. So there's a lot of excitement things and that's what we're looking forward to be investing. That's similar to what uh, Laura was talking about with the AI for managing the storage and, and hooking that all together, right? It, that's great. Um, great, let's move on to Mark then. All right, uh, Mark, uh, please introduce yourself in Sunrun. Great, thanks, Derek, uh, and glad to be here. Uh, Mark Trout, I'm the CTO for Sunrun. Um, prior to that, I was the CTO for Vivid Solar prior to our acquisition um, in October. So have a little bit of background from both of those. Um, we are a residential solar company. We have over uh, 500,000 customers in the solar and storage space, um, actively growing. We're in 22 states plus DC and Puerto Rico today. Um, largely those states are driven by economic viability of solar. Um, but at the same time, as, as uh, states and municipalities make it more attractive, then the opportunities to grow continue to exist. Um, we have about 10,000 employees um, growing rapidly. Um, and uh, our primary focus has been on residential PV plus storage. Um, storage attach rates are growing very fast. Uh, partially driven by a lot of the climate change that we're seeing between the California wildfires, the experience in Texas this week, et cetera. Um, we're getting a lot of uh, demand for not just uh, from a financial perspective, but also from a, a choice perspective, customer choice and customer uh, managing their own storage and providing resiliency to their power situation. And so we're seeing a lot of that come through. Um, I do have responsibility for our technical selections as well as all of our software. And my background comes out of Silicon Valley. So uh, spent most of the time uh, with software companies and trying to bring some of that to this renewable space over the last uh, seven years. Great, yeah, thanks for that. So you mentioned you're seeing more customers really valuing energy choice over maybe purely the financial case for solar. Um, how are you seeing that play out? Um, we're getting a lot of, uh, you know, definitely increasing in conversations about storage and you're just seeing that happen because really what's happened is the price of storage has come down, the availability of storage has come down and also the need, the need has gone up and you just, you just look at it, you read it in the press, you can see it in the media and really customers are trying to um, play more of a part in their own energy choice, in their own energy situation. Um, it's moved from purely a, can we save money off of our current energy bill to one of, can we provide backup? Can we provide um, some time of use offsetting as it looks at uh, rates and, and things like that. And uh, we see that continuing. We, we talk a lot about uh, the electrification of the consumer's home. Um, as within Sunrun, and we talk about all the things that consumers are starting to do to take a much more active management of their energy um, situation of their dependency and things like that. And so, so all of those are driving to this, this increase in choice, this increase in understanding at the consumer level. Yeah, that's really interesting. As uh, Thanasis mentioned, the outages here in Texas, I'm in Houston, and I was thinking about, I mean, I had several people who, uh, I, I luckily had some gas powered uh, furnace and stove and stuff. And um, I was would be hesitant to move that to fully electric unless I had a solar storage system on my house that, you know, that feeds those needs directly. And so that increased choice uh, would be a game changer for, for what we need for this electrification to happen. Um, yeah, and it, all, it all does kind of exist together. You know, and I think that's, you've got the three of us on here, each kind of representing a little bit of a different perspective, but, but at the same time, we're all dealing with the same thing, which is the energy use, the grid, the uh, distribution of energy, and all of those things need to come together and work together. And, and in fact, that's the evolution that we're seeing is really how does that continue to manifest, continue to transform and transition to a, 
as, as Laura mentioned, a low carbon footprint across the, the, the world. That's right. So, and uh, also thinking about that linear model or that hub and spoke model, today, most people interact with their energy as an invisible commodity, but this greater consumer choice really could fundamentally change how people interact with their energy. Uh, what are you seeing or what are you thinking about to change in the customer experience uh, as people move in this direction? You know, there's really three, three things around uh, uh, the customer experience. One is, is education, of course, you know, solar, PV, storage. It's not something that most of us grew up understanding. And so there's a lot of education that's going on at the consumer level. So, so that education is, is a key growth component of it. Um, access to the information and, and through access, really the insights that you're gaining. Um, what we see on the customer side is really providing insight to what's going on. You know, where is power being generated? Where are they using it from? What are they paying for it? Um, what devices? You get down to the, to the home level and you start talking about what devices. Um, the more electrification products that are involved in a home, the more the user wants that insight. And so really making sure that they have that data. We've talked a little bit about the massive amounts of data that are available. And now they're coming down to the customer level, whether that's through a, you know, a, a cell phone app or via the web or some, some instance of either of the both. Um, really that insight is what we're seeing change the customer experience. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, and it, it seems like with that, you mentioned any electric device, maybe wanting to pull that all together and see it together. So that, that feels like you'd have a need for digital API driven integrations with partners and, you know, smart homes and all, all of that. Absolutely. And, and that's one of the things that you're seeing, you know, if you've, if you've, shop for appliances or if you've you've purchased new appliances and things like that everything is wi-fi enabled well that means that they're streaming data somewhere so how do you start to tap into those data streams and those data feeds and consolidate that into a view for the customer and you know each of us if we've if we've modernized any portion of our homes or our lifestyle we have numerous apps to try to pull that together and how do you pull that together into a spot where you can now uh, continue to get a view and some insight to what to do, what to change. Mm -hmm. And I think you're just seeing more and more of that happen um, across all of the, uh, the conveniences in our home these days. Yeah, I, I think I have a separate app for my oven and for my fridge. And so all they do is just notify me when I need to change my water filter so far. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and that will, that will eventually become something where you can look at the you know, and we can see it today. The electrical signatures will tell us it's a fridge that's running. We can tell you by that signature whether that's a good fridge or a one that you should probably replace. And so that level of data is something that, that really can provide insights to the customer. And if they are, and, and we believe the customers are getting more engaged with their energy situation. You know, 10 years ago, you moved into a new home, you just bought the power from the local power company. Maybe if you were in a municipality, you had some options and some choice, but, but for a large portion of the country, it was one. Now with the solar and the residential solar and the storage, you, you play a more active participation in that. And through that active participation, you're expanding, you know, EV chargers are going in lots of places. Uh, uh, many of us have EV cars. And so as that continues to adopt, the, the automobile industry is moving rapidly to switching over their entire fleets. And as they do that, that's just going to be more information sitting there with the customer trying to manage it. That's right. No, that's, that's really fascinating. Um, thanks, Mark. All right, we're going to move into the general Q&A section now. So um, thanks. We'll see if there's any open questions. All right, well, we'll just open this up. Um, kind of referring back to that uh, that growth and the growth potential, uh, just open it up to any of the panelists. Uh, where do you see the growth potentials be and um, and how the part you're playing or the part other uh, parts of the grid are playing in, in driving that growth potential? Um, maybe- you pick one of us? <laughs> yeah, uh, you wanna go, Mark? 
Um, sure, sure. I mean, I think the partnerships are, are really important, right? We, we're, you can talk about grid services as one of the ones that might bring all, all of us together in partnership. Um, you know, the distributed energy right now is playing a, a key role for helping to stabilize some of the, the massive changes and outages we've been seeing. And so you, how do you do distributed energy? It becomes a very common topic. And, and whether that's integration through something like VPP, virtual power plants, and the virtual power plant sits in between a consumer's residential storage and load and demand and, and up through the grid to you know, respond to dispatch events. And so that integration is a growth area for all of us. And I think it's a growth area where we have to play well together. We've got software, you know, the, the whole digital space, the amount of data that, that uh, Thanasis was mentioning, the amount of data that's going to be consumed to drive that is massive. And, and the speed at which that data is going to be there is going to be important, as well as on the, on the utility side, the, the the forecasting of that and the things that Laura was mentioning around some of that. And it's just going to become a part where all of us play together. Yeah, thanks. Laura, did you have uh, something to add there? Yeah, I'll just add, I, I fully agree. Uh, distributed is a huge area of future growth. I think that, and maybe it's just because I had a biased view because prior to coming to NG, we were really focused on grid scale. Um, so it's possible that I was just late to the party, but it feels to me that you're really seeing a huge push for studies and data to demonstrate that just because it's bigger and easier um, to do a you know, 200, 500 megawatt you know, wind or solar facility versus putting it you know, locally across the system so it's more cost effective for customers. There's a lot of new studies now coming out that are really demonstrating that that may not be an accurate theory that you really can achieve cost savings in a big way by doing the very strategic surgical things that Mark is talking about by placing these strategically on the grid. And I think Thanasis was saying as well, where you've got congestion, that's where you need to be focusing on sourcing a battery. That's where you need to be putting distributed resources for those very specific points on the system so that you're not dealing with the lowest common denominator and still having huge price spikes out in the remote areas of the system where you've got congestion or just too much of one thing and not enough of another in a moment, you know, when you're trying to balance the grid. Great, thanks. All right, let's take this next question to Thanasis uh, as our innovator entrepreneur. So it, you're already in one space, but if you had to attack a new business opportunity somewhere in the sector, what, what other thing might you uh, look at? I think it's, uh, you know, you, you want to start a business with obviously as little capital, you know, uh, and, and attack something that has high growth. As long as you have high tech capabilities in terms of software development, or you can outsource them, I would highly encourage somebody to look into this distributed area and what are the software needs, whether it's a virtual power plant or a part of a power plant or you know, if you want to do custom applications for a utility that needs to explore these areas or produce some artificial intelligence um, algorithm that will deal with congestion, those are some very, very high value applications that I see. And traditionally, you know, as you know, software businesses have the lowest kind of capital deployed and the highest ROI. And so if somebody has that inclination, I would encourage them to look into those areas. Great. Thank you. Uh, Laura, Mark, anything to add on that question? I mean, I just, I have increasingly seen demand for self-sufficiency, mm. um, which is good and bad, right? There's a lot of inefficiency if done improperly to self-sufficiency, but we are seeing extreme weather everywhere. And I can't count the times in the last five years that I've seen references to a one in 100 year event. These are happening all the time between hurricanes, between the wildfires. Now this massive, sorry, but catastrophe that just occurred in the ERCOT. I mean, people I think are all of a sudden becoming desperate to be able to ensure that they have heat and water and what they need for their families and their children. And I, I'm seeing, I imagine that there's probably a huge rush right now on diesel generators. 
which is exactly the opposite direction that we all need to go in my personal humble opinion as a society. But that's probably where people are going to go because of you know, reliability, ease, um, just knowing that it's there regardless of what the weather's doing. Um, so to me, I, I just feel like we really need those smart, young, beautiful brains out there to start putting their energy around the silver bullet of what is clean and reliable that can be digitally connected to help the overall grid as a whole and be able to bring those pieces together versus an individual family hunkering down into your most, most primal instincts of I need to take care of my own and it, it's not going to be the optimal solution for our society. Great, thanks for that. Um, next question uh, from David Rich. Uh, what can cloud providers do to up their game to support the industry? Um, can jump in a little bit on that one if you want, yeah. Derek. You know, I, I think one of the things that you're you're starting to see and hear is the amount of data, right, and the frequency of data. And and if you think about this, if you take it all the way out to the consumer, this is a massive IoT type of structure that we're building out. And so your your comms lines, mm. how does communication? Tenasis mentioned it as a security and things like that. The hardening that's going to be required in the comms industry is going to be critical, right? If we have a, a, a demand event and all of a sudden nobody's connected to cellular or Wi-Fi or things like that, it, it's not going to work, right? So, so we, I think that there's, there's definitely some need in the comms field. There's some need in the data you know, manipulation of the data processing and streamlining of that. Um, you know, you talked about APIs in your question to me earlier. You know, APIs are going to have to both be efficient as well as prevalent, right? The prevalence of these kinds of things so that we can connect and operate. And the cloud plays just a massive role in all of those things. It, it's, it would be hard to, to say we could ever disconnect. I think really what we're talking about is being very connected. And, and that's, that's it, taking that to a different level. Yeah, no, that's great. Really great insights on different areas or things where they're gonna need it, right? It's gonna be a more complex system, but that's a more connected and with that complexity it could be more resilient if, if it's done right. Um, if I can right. add one more uh, quick comment to that, I would say yeah. that there are cloud providers out there that see themselves as infrastructure providers and they say, hey, look, we have this infrastructure, use it. I think that they need to take a, a, a leap, you know, kind of forward and say, we can actually help you see the vision. We can actually help you see the applications. We can actually help you have some partners here. We have that capability to support you with these applications so you can move into it. It's kind of using the old expression, you know, take the, the horse to the water kind of thing because we have a cognitive issue here. You know, the people that are in the utility business for a long time trying to see these new applications it's kind of a, a far away movie for them. You know, you have to really show them how do you put the movie together? Mm. No, that's great. Yeah, it's so it's, you can't, uh, we, we've had, had this before with our clients where someone says, all right, here's this, these building blocks, the Legos, go ahead and build something. And then it's like, well, I don't know what I want to build. And then you don't, you can't see the value. But if you have a partner that can kind of jump in with you on the business value or the problems to be solved, right. uh, it helps a lot. All right, next question. Uh, these have been great so far. How does the customer load visibility lend itself to future opportunities for provider or consumer efficiencies in managing energy mismatches to provide power savings? Um, maybe Laura, uh, if you have a... Yeah, you know, so one of the things, it's a little bit different context, but when um, I was at Avant Grid, we operated an independent balancing authority and we had 1400 megawatts of wind in the Pacific Northwest. And we actually registered and took on that four second, you know, integration and balancing of that resource. And there were a couple of companies that approached us about the ability to offer balancing capability to us utilizing consumer load. And one of them had, I think, um, signals tied to water heaters. And, you know, if somebody had like a large freezer or something, or I think there was also refrigeration that was in that. And basically they had 
gotten signals to all of those um, devices and they were able to aggregate them and they were able to dispatch them and they were able to do it in a way that was very sophisticated such that the customer could basically put in their set points for their, and air conditioning of course was one of the other elements of it. And they were able to say, okay, I'm willing to let you take my home temperature up to 75 degrees on a hot day and down to 66 degrees on a cold day, or you could set it at whatever you wanted. And that allowed them to kind of understand what flexibility they had with the devices in that home to be able to change load capabilities. And by using all of that data and integrating all of that together, they were able to create a block of energy. Um, and for us, it hadn't come far enough to be large enough. We had such a large um, load, we really needed blocks of 25 megawatts or above. But you could see how this really could be done. The capability is there now. And if you have that visibility into those consumer loads and consumer preferences, and the important piece too, which is I think is so important for customer choice and to get people to buy into this, is they could override it. If they were having a dinner party and they didn't want their guests to be too cold or too hot, for that moment, they could say, sorry, you can't touch my load right now. And they were able to you know, kind of override that. And I think that visibility and that capability of bringing this all together, the potential is enormous. I just think it's not fully tapped yet. And I think that's really where you can see value in integrating and providing this genuine value to the grid through that visibility of consumer load. And Derek, if I could just tag yeah. on to what Laura just said, right? She talked about the customer, the consumer experience, right? And, mm -hmm. and you can see a day in the future where opting into a demand event or opting out of a demand event is something that the consumer is going to get on their mobile device saying, you want in, you want out mm -hmm. and have the ability to control those. And, you know, it will be much more than just static. Today, we're approaching it as a static demand response kind of model. But what if it becomes more active? And what if it becomes something where you can opt in and opt out, maybe this week, maybe next week, maybe today, mm -hmm. um, this afternoon, or tomorrow, right? And, and all of those right. frequencies are going to be things that, that you're going to start to see happen. And as Laura said, the integration of all of that load at a consumer level is able to be shed or able to be controlled. And that's pretty important. And you, do, you, you know, compound that with batteries and the capacity on the storage. And you've got a real model for you know consumers to participate. Yeah, that's it's interesting. I, I I'm gonna think of it in terms of the event we had last week here in Texas. Like we had rolling blackouts where either ever you were completely on or completely off. But if you're able to say, all right, rather than completely off, I just need to cut back to 25% of what I normally use right now. That is incredible flexibility, right? And and that's the sort of thing that yeah. should be possible or could be possible in the future. But it'll take a little bit more. Yeah, it's a really smart, intelligent idea, you know, alongside what Mark mentioned here. Fantastic. Or if you had, you know, in your example, Derek, if you had solar generation that you were otherwise selling to the uh, energy, to the utility for two cents or five cents, if at that time there was an ability to sell the energy at nine thousand dollars a megawatt hour that was actually being sold, a lot of people would be doing that. And so this is a really smart, you know, intelligent kind of new application that would be potentially allowed in the future. I think I love that idea, Mark. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Thank you. All right. Our next question is, uh, how is all distributed energy load and data being taken into account with the wholesale risk management systems? Um, so connecting the, the load and the energy with the risk management systems. Um, On risk management, I'm, I'm not quite sure um, what that means, but in terms of the data from distributed and my response to this is it's really geographical. Mm -hmm. I think it depends on the market structure. I know that when we were a vertically integrated utility as Pacificorp and we had people putting solar panels on their roofs, we didn't have any visibility into anything in that home. And generation would just show up and flow because of the nature of physics onto the grid. And we didn't have any visibility into that. And I, I feel like that largely might be the case in a lot of areas because in, in, up until very recently, when you would look at the California ISO, which is a massive energy system, they did not have full visibility into the behind the meter installations. And there were so many great tax incentives that those really started to become more than just noise on the system. And it became a real reliability issue, I think for that entity. And I, I you know, 
confess I don't, I'm not close enough to it to know how much progress they've made in managing that. But my sense is there's still a lot of room because I think there's still a lot of blindness to what is happening on a lot of those distributed installations. Yeah, and another great point where digital connection is going to be really essential. That's really the only way you can solve that problem. I mean, people can't like phone in when their uh, solar system is contributing back to the grid other than through automated way. Um, I think the other way that maybe a question could be taken would be in like wholesale supply, uh, like hedges. Um, I don't know if any of any of the panelists here have uh, enough uh, familiarity with those sort of supply desk REP hedges um, to speak to that. We have a lot of experience with hedges because that's something that we apply to our projects. Um, Potentially there's capabilities there that can be used, but it's an inherently very complex financial instrument that it may lead, if it's not applied correctly, it may lead to a lot of liabilities for consumers. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, with the use of smart software that can provide a certain very targeted application may be used, but exposing consumers to such complex swap instruments is, is very complicated. Yeah, makes sense. All right. Um... Next question then, um, what do you see as the biggest inhibitor to capturing the full potential of the new energy vision that we've been talking about? Um, maybe go through- Can I take Mark that as a- Manassas? Yeah, there I we go. Um, I think I, I said that word again, I think it's mostly a cognitive issue and, a, and an issue of uh, people that have established positions in the industry taking themselves out of that and creating a vision for themselves. And I wanna say, bringing the example here of Laura, uh, Laura's leadership and NG overall that dropped all the thermal plants and now they're into a new world of renewables and it's not easy. Laura said it, it's tough to find the right projects with the right returns and you have to figure yourself out what other products and services we can offer, surround ourselves, improve value to the customer and do that. It's never easy when you go into a new transition. Um, uh, we have the example here of Sunrun being a fantastic company and still, you know, it's a massive company and still, you know, they're not obviously at the level where they needed to be in terms of profitability and everything, all that is gonna improve. So you have to accept that when you move into these massive transitions um, of these large industries, you have to take a position that is vulnerable to some extent in the beginning, but you have to have a vision of how to complement it. To, to make this a very simple example is when we were in Dell, we started selling PCs and that was the biggest product that we were selling. The mainframe guys were laughing at us in the beginning because they were like, we are the big guys. You can't do stuff with PCs. You can't do these banking applications with PCs. And guess what? The world now is run by PCs and Dell now is a bigger company than a lot of those large mainframe companies. So, but, but what is really important is not having just a vision but having the ability to execute and drive a high growth business model and Dell did that, and we had the highest growth company for a long time, became the darling of Wall Street, and Wall Street, you know, and, and provided very high returns for investors, although it was a low margin business. And so I would say to investors and people that want to enter, you know, you have to create a vision for yourself and see what the end result is and where you're leading and have a capable team with great execution ability and a strong business model that will get you there. Because in the beginning, every transition is tough. Mark, Laura, uh, your, your thoughts about what the biggest inhibitor to capturing this vision is? That's great, Thanasis. Do you want to go first, Mark? I, I definitely sure, have to it. <laughs> uh, so I, I would say that it's a, a toss up probably between um, policy and regulatory structures is the first impediment um, that I see. And just for an example, with storage, I think you know, we're seeing what's happened so many times before where the industry gets ahead of the market structures. And we saw that with wind energy. And you saw that because there's sort of different, you know, incentives in different places and the structures are so different from market to market that you saw people flooding to these high wind areas that were you know, less complicated to permit and get everything that you needed to interconnect. And what you ended up with was just a massive glut of too much of a good thing in an area, which then created negative price issues and congestion issues along the system. And it's in my view, because we didn't have 
a structure and a vision set up up front that was coordinated with the needs of the grid that would provide incentives in the right places. And I, I fear we're seeing the same phenomenon with storage where people are so excited about storage as am I, and you see the value, it's just so intuitive when you've got intermittent generation storage, it makes all the sense in the world that you bring these pieces together, but we're, we're not seeing the market structures develop fast enough. And you're going to see the same thing, I'm quite sure of people putting huge investments in the areas that make sense for them, but in the broader scheme of things over time is probably not going to be the best structure. So, so I think that piece of it, if, if there's a way to get to more of a coordinated, thoughtful vision about how to do these things. I see the same issue with offshore wind in you know, the Northeast of the United States. Really, I don't know that anyone could argue that what would make the most sense is to have a coordinated backbone of high voltage transmission in those quarters of the sea, such that the projects can efficiently connect you're not trying to drill into the seabed for individual tie lines and cables on each individual project that's owned by an individual company, but you, they can't get it done because the states want autonomy and the states are in a competition to be the you know, place where offshore jobs are created. And so they're not cooperating. They're not gonna do what's needed to create that backbone and that overarching structure. And then you've got the project owners that are investing billions in these projects and they don't want something that's completely out of their control that they would be reliant on in order to connect and deliver on the obligations under their contracts. So I just, it's, it's a theme that I see across the entire industry of people wanting to be, you know, territorial and control what they can control for their state or their utility or their market or whatever it is, and, and really creates an impediment to really what could be a much more optimal solution for the industry as a whole. Right. Eric, if I could jump on with what Laura just said, you know, I, I would take it also to the corporate views, right? I mean, we're at a point where an analogy to the cellular versus landline phone uh, model could be made here, right? The, the, the energy model that we have today could be likened to the, to the landline. And, and if you think about the disruption, companies have to believe, first they have to believe that it's disruption time. This is this industry, the capabilities are out there. It is going to be disrupted. So mm -hmm. if it's going to be disrupted, you, you have to believe in an abundance mentality in the new model. So companies that are going to be progressive and believe that there's enough for the companies to share, to go around, there's enough of this new industry model, but you got to be there. You've got to get there. And if you're not, you're going to die. And so the reality is, is it's, a, it's a massive disruption in the industry. It's a massive disruption in the fundamental architecture of the industry. And companies and corporations, and as Laura said, policymakers and regulatory bodies, they've all got to see that that's happening. And, and if they you know, play ostrich and stick their head in the sand, it's, they're going to miss it. And it's going to happen. Technology has a way of evolving and it's going to continue to evolve. And this is going to be, it's good for the earth. It's good for the climate. This low carbon. Yeah. Nothing's going to stop it. That's, I appreciate that. So last question. I will have maybe one word or one sentence from each of you. Uh, what is one trend you see evolving that isn't talked about enough? So the uh, one sentence on that. I think I don't see a more in, in a lot of discussion about, you know, high, high tech in the grid. Don't see enough of that at all. Great. Laura? Yeah, I would agree. I think the capability that exists and the potential that exists to bring all of the components of data together for the industry is something that is not talked about enough and something that is not being explored in a comprehensive way. Great. Vanessa, uh, Mark? Um, I'd say common standards. You know, if you think about it, common standards for permitting, common standards for data, common standards is something that the, you know, high tech industry spent a lot of time on. I think it needs to come over here. We've got to understand what we're trying to tie into and, and make it common, common Perfect. highways. Thank you. Um, and thank you to our panel. This has been a fantastic discussion. I've really enjoyed it. Um, yeah. I, I love the abundance mindset comments that the disruption in the grid and all the, the new thinking you're having. 
Uh, we'd love to help at Parveda. So if, if, if you have uh, uh, ability or want to reach out to us, we'd love to have conversations with you about what we can do. So uh, thank you to everybody and see you soon. Thank you. Really enjoyed it. Thank you very much, Mark. Laura, nice meeting you. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.